Almighty God, we ask that you kindle in all of our hearts the true love of peace and guide with your wisdom those who take counsel for the nations of the earth, that in tranquility your dominion may increase until the earth is filled with the knowledge of your love through Jesus Christ our Lord, who lives and reigns with you in unity of the Holy Spirit, one God, now and forever. And now, Father, prepare our hearts, O Lord, to accept your word. Silence in us any voice but your own, that hearing we may also obey your will. Through Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. In the invocation, we heard from Jeremiah chapter 30, verses 1 through 11. This is the opening passage in what is commonly known in Jeremiah as the Book of Consolation, a series of prophetic poems anticipating the time when God would redeem his exiled people, particularly the exiled nation of Judah. And it's more than appropriate for the Christmas season. In this passage, God promises to liberate his people from oppressive yokes, to restore them to himself, and to raise up a king from the line of David who will reign over them. All themes that we attend to during the season of Advent. But when I was reading over this passage in preparation for this week, the verse that caught my attention wasn't even a whole verse. But the first half of Jeremiah 30, verses 1 through 11. There God says, For I am with you to save you, declares the Lord. And I couldn't shake it. Tried to read and gloss for some other things that I was trying to prepare for the service, but I just kept coming back to, I am with you to save you, and thought, yeah, yeah, that's it. If you need a little compact sermon for what Advent season is about, I am with you to save you, declares the Lord. It captures the hope of Advent season with sacred precision, summing up in just five Hebrew words. I love that about the Hebrew. What countless sermons and reflections have tried to say, including the one you are about to hear. And for not saying very much, this verse manages to also say everything. And it's only natural that the Advent connection jumped off the page. The idea of God being with us is never as fresh on our minds as it is during this time of year. I imagine that many of us, when we hear the very expression, God with us, either think of Isaiah chapter 7, verse 14, or Matthew's words in his, the first chapter of his gospel. And these are those words. This is Matthew chapter 1. I'll read beginning in verse 18. Now the birth of Jesus Christ took place in this way. When his mother Mary had been betrothed to Joseph, before they came together, she was found to be with child from the Holy Spirit. And her husband Joseph, being a just man and unwilling to put her to shame, resolved to divorce her quietly. But as he considered these things, behold, an angel of the Lord appeared to him in a dream, saying, Joseph, son of David, do not fear to take Mary as your wife, for that which is conceived in her is from the Holy Spirit. She will bear a son, and you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. All this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us. This is the word of the Lord. Notice how the with you to save you is present in the text. Matthew sums up the birth of Jesus by saying all this took place to fulfill what the Lord had spoken by the prophet Isaiah. Behold, the virgin shall conceive and bear a son, and they shall call his name Emmanuel, which means God with us, with you. And right before this, an angel of the Lord appears to Joseph in a dream. There's those angels again. Assuring him that Mary, his now pregnant fiance, is not an adulteress as he feared, but that she has conceived a child by the power of the Holy Spirit. The angel then summarizes what this spirit-born child is, who he is, and what he will do, saying, You shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. There's the to save you. 
Indeed, the name Jesus in and of itself means Yahweh, the Lord, saves. And now we know what he saves us from. Sin. With you to save you from sin. And this is all Matthew says. That's it. He just moves right on from here. Following paragraph begins, Now after Jesus was born in Bethlehem. Why so brief? Couldn't he have elaborated like Luke did? And of all the things to bring up, sin? I mean, Matthew almost sounds trite, typical religious jargon that is ignorant to the problems of the day. Don't we need more these days than another talking to on sin? I often feel that way. Don't you? We've heard the sin thing before. Some of us, since we were children, we need a message more relevant to the times, one that addresses the prevalent concerns of our culture. And I think this is why many of us, if we're honest, gravitate to Luke's account of Jesus' birth instead of Matthew's. Luke is much more sensitive to the implications of Jesus' birth for matters of justice and for the outsiders and the overlooked. That's what we need. Enough of this sin talk. Now, I think, in general, that this comes from a good place, a well-meaning place. We want to know, we're concerned to know, the implications of the gospel for the nitty-gritty of our real lives. And so we're just concerned for our community is all. Well, Eugene Peterson doesn't think so. In his book, Christ Plays in 10,000 Places, Peterson thinks our hurry to address so-called real issues doesn't reveal how virtuous we are, but it actually reveals a problem. The problem, he suggests, is, quote, that we happen to live in a culture that has a low sense of sin. We think we've got bigger problems than sin. Or worse, we just think sin's not that big of a deal. Now, maybe you're hearing this and you feel inclined to protest. I certainly did. You think, that's not true, right? It can't be. We know the Bible verses, especially the two in Romans, Romans 3.23, for all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. And Romans 6.23, for the wages of sin is death. We know those. That's Bible drill stuff. But Peterson's evidence is compelling. He says that a dead giveaway of this cultural leniency is in, quote, our propensity to deny or minimize sin. We rarely, if ever, call something sin. Instead, Peterson says, euphemisms abound. Mistake, this is a quote, bad call, poor judgment, error, wrong, negligent, a slip up, an oversight, a misstep, stupidity, bungle, faux pas, and so on. Do any of those sound familiar? But I'll take it a step Peterson didn't, because it's not just that we avoid using the word sin to describe sin. It's that we do that. Meanwhile, headlines today describing current events employ hyperbolic descriptions like crisis, devastation, disaster, Conspiracy, corruption, the most important blank of our lifetime, unlike anything we've ever seen, and so on. Now, I'm not trying to trivialize the truth behind some of these claims. Just thinking about the virus, I know many of you had ears to hear. You know that lots of those headlines have been about this virus. It's devastated the globe, truly. Thousands have lost their lives. Almost as many thousands have lost their livelihoods. Their businesses, economies are crashing, and alcoholism, mental health problems, and domestic abuse have all seen an alarming uptake. So these are serious concerns. These are legit, and they require prayerful and thoughtful answers from God's people, and their legitimacy is not to be discredited. Be that as it may, if our rhetoric, if our language is any indicator of our priorities, then there are things that we think are more threatening to our current situation than sin. But Matthew will not be distracted 
The people of God undoubtedly need a saving from a lot of things, and that's why it's good to have the prophets and the Gospel of Luke, which help us know what to think and pray about those things. But a first importance for Matthew is sin, people's sins. Sin, if you need a definition, is a refused relationship with God that spills over into wrong relationships with others. It is a failure to live in obedience of the two greatest commandments. First, to love the Lord your God with all your heart and all your soul and all your mind and all your strength. And second, the one like it, is to love your neighbor as yourself. And the consequences are serious. Matthew's promise, this verse, he will save his people from their sins, is actually an echo of Psalm 130, one of the very popular psalms of ascent. And the opening verses of the psalm capture the hopelessness of humanity and their sin. The psalmist says, Out of the depths I cry to you, O Lord. O Lord, hear my voice. Let your ears be attentive to the voice of my pleas for mercy. If you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, O Lord, who could stand? Sin plunges humanity and the world with it into a chaotic, lifeless abyss. An abyss of deep darkness, the darkness of the shadow of death. And for all the effort, all the effort that we put in to try to minimize the severity of sin in our speech, God refuses to minimize the severity of sin in his judgment. The question, if you, O Lord, should mark iniquities, who could stand, is obviously rhetorical. The psalmist feels no need to provide a written answer, because the answer is no one. And anyone who heard this psalm would have known that. No one. And seeing the horror of this reality for what it is, the psalmist cries, cries to God, pleads to God to hear his voice, to be attentive to his circumstances, to do something about this, about sin. Because if God doesn't do something about that, nothing else matters. But as is so typical in psalms like this, the anguished plea of the psalmist shifts to a recollection of hope and of trust. See, the psalmist is confident that God will hear and that God will answer. He says, but with you there is forgiveness, that you may be feared. I wait for the Lord, my soul waits, and in his word I hope. My soul waits for the Lord more than the watchman in the morning. More than the watchman in the morning, he repeats himself. O oh, Israel, hope in the Lord, for with the Lord there is steadfast love, and with him is plentiful redemption, for he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities. And it's that final line, he will redeem Israel from all his iniquities, that Matthew echoes in his gospel, communicating to his readers and his hearers that the expectation of the psalmist has found fulfillment in the birth of Jesus. The Lord does not mark iniquities, and thank God for it. But with him is steadfast love. With him is plentiful redemption. God has heard the world's cries. Our souls don't need to wait for him any longer. The watchmen need not strain their eyes, scanning the darkness, because a new light has dawned. God is coming. God does not wait from afar for us to figure it out. And he doesn't make us find the way to him by ourselves. God comes, entering into the very depths from which we have cried, forgiving us of our constant refusal to have relationship with him and to restore us not only to himself, but thank God to one another. I am with you to save you, declares the Lord. And Matthew compresses all of this, all of it, into one verse you shall call his name Jesus, for he will save his people from their sins. This one verse, which keeps us grounded, reminding us for all of our needs we have that there are none greater than for our sins to be forgiven. That as destructive as recent crises have been, there is no crisis more destructive than sin. This one verse which curtails any and all of our tendencies to explain away the severity of our disobedience. And yet, this one verse that says God 
the Lord, which is his personal revelation of himself, and it never gets more personal than Jesus, is with us. This one verse, it says, he is with us in a way unthinkable, born of a virgin in an insignificant restroom stop town of Bethlehem. This one verse, which provides for us a summary of the hope of Advent, this one verse is strong and catches our imagination because it's so brief. Because while not saying very much, this one verse also manages to say everything. Amen.